We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for uh, the grace of you in our, each of our lives. Lord, we thank you for that amazing grace, uh, that unending love, God, Lord, uh, that, God, it, even when uh, we stumble and when we fail, God, your grace picks us up. It helps us to keep going, Lord. And I pray for all of us here uh, today, God, for whatever uh, issues that we're dealing with right now in our lives, God, Lord, I pray that we'll all know a, a, a touch of that a wonderful, amazing grace to touch each of our hearts uh, this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, guys, it's good to see you all. Uh, uh, I was, uh, I, I mentioned last week, I was away uh, just for a few days, went to uh, Buxton in the Peak District. It was very nice, the, uh, lovely, lovely holiday. I visited my auntie, uh, my Dad got remarried <laughs> as well, which is obviously a bit of a, a bit of a, a big thing. Um, and so, but it's good to be back, and it's good to be able to, to share uh, from God's word uh, this morning. You may remember uh, going back a, a number of weeks ago. Um, I, I was beginning a, a short series leading up into the Easter period uh, called Carpe Diem, seizing, seizing our day, and seizing our uh, each day as it comes uh, for the God of Christ for the message. Of Jesus in, in our world. And uh, last week, uh, a few weeks ago, I shared a little bit about that we need to be the good news, uh, to, share, to share the good news. Uh, but I want to share to you uh, this morning is uh, again, continue with this series from Mark chapter 1 of how to prepare your world for a Jesus encounter. Uh, we're coming up to the most significant event or moment in our, the Christian calendar. Obviously, obviously, and we remember Jesus' life, his death, his burial, his resurrection, his ascension into heaven. All of history hinges on the events that happened in less than two weeks from now. When Christ went to the cross, when he died in our place, when he rose from the dead. And I believe that God wants us as his people to prepare our world to receive Jesus, to encounter the risen Christ. In, during the medieval uh, ages, hundreds of years ago, there were a group of people who had the responsibility to prepare a way for the king. And so if a king or a monarch was going to visit a town or a village, uh, this person would go to the town and the village, uh, they would announce to the village, the king is coming, uh, you need to prepare yourselves because the king is going to come. Uh, they will make sure that all the, 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 the venues are ready, that the ceremonies are in place to celebrate the, the occasion of the king. They'll make sure the food preparations are ready. They'll make sure the security detail is all, 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 is all sorted out. Uh, they ensure that, that the, the entertainment is ready, that everything is put in place. The speeches are crafted and prepared so that when the king arrives... There's no surprises, okay? The king arrives, the, king, the, or the monarch is on, honored, and the, and, the, and the occasion is celebrate, celebrated. The, 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 these people were called heralds. And basically what the herald did was they prepared a way for the king. They would teach the people the, the etiquette, the things that they should do in the presence of the king. I'm sure they, they still have them today at some, at some level or another. But if a monarch was to make a visit to a certain place, how you should conduct yourself. But imagine for a moment if the herald didn't prepare themselves for such an important task. They didn't adequately craft their speech or coordinate with the local authorities. They didn't determine the appropriate venues or the welcoming ceremonies. They failed to, co failed to collaborate with the law enforcement or conduct the rehearsals for the, cer for the ceremonies. In failing to prepare... They would have failed to prepare the community for such an important visit and it would have led clearly to an embarrassing outcome for everyone involved. And so the Herald plays a very important role in making a way for the monarch, for the king to come. Now as God's people, we are called to be heralds. We are called to be heralds in our world to prepare a way for the King of Kings to come. Jesus has come once, and he's coming again. Did you know that? He is returning again, a second time, as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And he's, as a herald of, of the gospel of Jesus, we are called to, to make way for the King. 
to make way, to prepare a way in our hearts and the lives of those around us for the King of Kings to bring a, a visitation to, to earth. And, and the very much of this, this role of being a herald of the gospel is about being prepared in ourselves, spiritually prepared in ourselves, preparing other people spiritually for the time when Christ will return physically here on earth. And so we prime our world, we prepare our world by preparing ourselves. And we are looking forward to the most significant event in the history of the human race, when Jesus will come again. And so coming up to Easter, as we uh, look at this short series of seizing our God-ordained moments, we're going to look at Mark chapter 1 again, and we're going to ask this question, how can you prepare your world for a Jesus encounter. I'm going to read here uh, from the first few verses, um, first eight verses of Mark chapter 1. And this is what Mark says at the beginning of his gospel. He says this, the beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. It is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness. Prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight paths for him. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to meet him, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the river Jordan. John wore clothing made of camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, he ate locusts and wild honey. That's a bit strange, isn't it? He really stood out, a bit like a sore thumb, didn't he, John did? And this was his message. After me comes one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless the reading of his word. As we look at this amazing account here at the beginning of Mark chapter 1, it becomes very apparent that John was a herald. <laughs> he was a herald of the gospel of Christ. He was preparing a way in the hearts of his listeners for the, their Messiah to come. And the result of his ministry was that throughout the whole of the Judean countryside, People turned up in their thousands to listen to John, to hear what he had to say. For some reason, they were drawn to this man. He was like a magnet. He just drew people to himself. And, he were, and as, a, as a result of his ministry, people were straightening out of their, their lives. Things that were just crooked, things that were out of place. He was saying, get your lives straightened up, okay? Straight in crooked ways because... The king is coming. One more greater, one more important than me is about to arrive. And at the back of this, people were getting immersed in water. And yet, none of this was about John. None of it was about John. All of this was about the person who had come after John. I believe that is what our role is as a church. We are to be like a John the Baptist in this generation. We are to be a people who serve God as heralds of the gospel. It's not about us. Who is it about? <laughs> Jesus. It's all about Jesus. It's all about pointing this world to the person of Jesus. To prepare this world for his second coming. John prepared the world for his first coming. But we, as heralds of the gospel, are called to prepare this world for his second coming. First, spiritually, in our hearts and the hearts of people around us, leading up to his physical visitation when he will return again. So how then can we prepare ourselves to prepare our world? I think there's five things that we can learn from this reading of the life of John the Dunker, or the Immerser. Or the dipper, <laughs> or the Baptist, as we familiarly know him. The first thing is this if we are to 
prepare our world for a Jesus encounter. We need to imbibe of His Word. We need, we need to be a people who spend time in His Word. You see, our life carries an authority when with the Holy Spirit's help we read the Scriptures regularly and ask God and to give us the strength that we need to, to live this out. Now listen, if you struggle reading, you know, we can, get, we can actually get audio Bibles now. And maybe you, can, you, str- you, you struggle with your reading, but there's plenty of audio Bibles you can have. In fact, the Bible says that faith comes by hearing. So it's as good just to hear the Word as it is to read the Word. But read the Word of God. Listen to the Word of God. And with the Holy Spirit's help, say, Lord, will you help me to put what I'm learning from your Word into practice? You see, your life carries a weightiness that brings actually an implicit rebuke to this world, to a world that is ignoring God, when you, uh, when you imbibe of the Word of God. Now, I find it really interesting that when Mark was writing this gospel to a mainly Roman audience who really had no background, no scriptural background, that he has no problem quoting scripture. He has no problem underlining the authority of scripture. When he, when he quotes the words of the prophet Isaiah, he says this, It is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. He was saying this, a me- John was a messenger. <laughs> and to be a messenger... He needed to be in the message. (laughs) And if we're not in the message, then we haven't got a message to bring. In fact, when we're in the message, in fact, there's a great translation by Eugene Peterson, I think it's called. It's called the Message Translation. It's written in contemporary English. I love it. It's fantastic. Really good translation. But we need to be in the message And we need to be asking God, Lord, help me to live out the message so that I can be the message to those around me as well as speak the message. And so God, when we we imbibe of his word, we are preparing our hearts and our life is actually having an impact on those around us. And that's why you need to come under the authority of God's word. Because when you do so, this is what happens. When you come under the authority of God's word, I believe that God gives you a voice. He gives you a voice into your generation. When everything, everyone is just doing their own thing, when everyone is just following popular opinion, like John the Baptist, you may seem to be a lonely, solitary figure, but because your life is founded on the word of God, you stand the test of time. Because you're standing your life on the truth of God's word. And that's what, I fact, in fact, some scholars believe, and I, I actually agree with this, I think that John the Baptist was actually really the last of the great Old Testament prophets. Before him, there was a series of prophets who came to the nation of Israel, I believe leading up to, to John until the time of Christ. But the thing about these prophets of old was this. Often the message that they brought wasn't very popular. People didn't like what they said. People didn't want to hear what they said. But they were faithful to God's word. And you know what? The result was that these prophets, they stood the test of time. Their words were proved to be true. And eventually, people would come back to God eventually. But, but, but the importance is this, that when we build our life on God's word... There is a consistency that comes out of our life. In fact, um, it was once thought and believed that the story of uh, Jonah and the whale was make believe. <laughs> uh, many, many of these uh, scholars thought that it didn't really, really happen. Well, how could anyone really survive in the belly of a, a large flesh fish? And then on the top of that, uh, it was also thought, well, you know what? This city, Nineveh, where's the city, Nineveh? I don't know anything about this city. Do you know anything about this? No, no. Oh, therefore, that that story of Jonah and the whale, it must be make-believe. It can't really have happened as described in the Bible. But then in the 1840s, an archaeologist 
Uh, but I'm going to try and get his name right. By the name of Sir Austin Henry Layard, was doing some ar- uh, archaeal excavation work, I think now in modern-day Iraq, and he came across the ruins of a city that had been wiped off the face of the earth for 2,000 years. <laughs> Any guesses on what the name of the city was? Mm-hmm. Nineveh. Now, what happened? i tell you what happened. This is what happened. God said to Jonah, you see those people in Nineveh? They're really bad. <laughs> If they don't change their ways, I'm going to destroy them. It's game over. Well, we all know the story, don't we, about Jonah, okay? He ran away from God, okay? He didn't want to obey God, but God got him, got him on his terms, gave him a second chance. He came to Nineveh. He preached the message, change your ways or you're destroyed. And guess what? A hundred percent response. Okay, the, uh, an evangelist's dream. Okay, everyone in the city of Nineveh turned back to God. And God spared the city. Wind the clock forward a hundred years. And it's a different story. Because soon the inhabitants of Nineveh are going back to their old ways. And this time, God said, I've had enough. This time he sent the prophet Nahum. And the prophet Nahum came to declare the judgment of God on the city of Nineveh. It's too late. It's game over. It's finished. Well, not long after that, the city was completely wiped out. And like I said, for 2,000 years, it remained undiscovered. You know, when God does a work, he does a thorough work, doesn't he? (laughs) He does a thorough work. The reason I'm saying this is simply this. The Bible has authority. It's his word to us. It's his word for us. And when we live our lives in the authority of, when we live our lives imbibing of his word, there is an authority that we carry in our life. Listen, we're all on a journey of uh, learning to walk in obedience to God. All of us are. <laughs> we all stumble, I know. But we, but we must all make the point of saying, Lord, I'm going to build my life on your word. Help me to, to, to live my life according to the standard of your word. The sec- second thing that we can see in John the Baptist's life is that if we are to prepare our world for the coming king, we also need to be willing to change. That you and I can't straighten others out if we're also not straightening out our own lives and straightening out crooked ways in our life. In fact, Jesus put it like this. He says, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye. (laughs) How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? (laughs) You hypocrite. (laughs) Come on, we all have a bit of hypocrisy in all of us, don't we? We all, let's be honest. (laughs) First, take the plank out of your own eye, and then you can see clearly to remove the speck out of your brother's eye. Now listen, Jesus isn't saying you shouldn't call out bad behavior. When there's bad behavior, it needs to be called out for what it is. It it needs to be shown for what it is. He isn't saying that, but what he is saying is, before we point out the faults of others, let's just examine ourselves first, okay? Okay? Let's search our own hearts first. Because I find the hardest person to lead is me. (laughs) I'm the hardest person. And I'm always aware that I always have my own blind spots. Okay, we could all be quick to see where others are at fault and fail to look at our own lives. Notice that John the Immerser, uh, John the Immerser, Mark records. That And John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness preaching a, repent, a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. You see, for John to call others to change, he first needed to be in a place where his own life was being straightened out. And to make your world ready, you first need to be changed in yourself. And that is the hardest decision you will ever make make. When you're honest about your own shortcomings, actually you could better empathize with others to help them through their struggles. Because you understand what, what it's like. 
And maybe for some of you here uh, this morning, or maybe just watching online, uh, an important step to being willing to change is to get baptized in water. Maybe you haven't yet been baptized. I want to encourage you to do so if you haven't done so. Because if you haven't been baptized, and you call yourself a follower of Jesus, what's stopping you from getting baptized? And the very first thing that the Lord commands us and directs us to do is to get baptized baptized in water you see when you get baptized in water we get immersed in water at the time when John was doing his ministry it wasn't at that time an identification of Jesus life death burial and resurrection because Jesus hadn't started his ministry at that time that was an understanding that would come later on but when John was baptizing what it was really about it was about preparing people to meet the king and when you get baptized yes it's an identification of the life their burial death bodily resurrection of Jesus but it's also I believe a preparing you to meet the king of kings when he comes a second time and we all know the story don't we of Naaman uh, the, the, the general in the army I think it was the Assyrian army and uh, he he wanted. He was had this terrible skin disease, this leprosy, and he it was instructed by the prophet Elisha to dip himself seven times in the Jordan River. And as he did so, the uncleanness of his life was washed away. I believe, in a similar sense, when we are getting baptized in water, we're saying, "Lord, whatever is past is past. I'm going to rise up to the newness of life, Lord, that you have for me." The third thing that we could see from the life of this man, John the Baptist, to be a herald of the gospel in our world, is that you need to stand out from the crowd. A herald, this herald John, was a peculiar person. I've seen some uh, pictures of some medieval heralds, and they had these like very strange costumes. They really just stood out. You know, they, they were very visible. They, you couldn't not notice them. Uh, in the same way, there was something about John's appearance that made him stand out. Mark records that John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist and he ate locusts and wild honey. <laughs> well, that really stands out, doesn't it? He really stood out. His physical appearance was so unlike those around him. And when you make a decision to live as an ambassador for Christ in your world, you are going to stick out like a sore thumb. You will even, maybe even seem to be a bit odd. <laughs> a bit odd. <laughs> in the eyes of some people. I'm sure I have. <laughs> I'm sure I have. Listen, a complete outlier. I, uh, a number of years ago, I can't remember if I told you I used to teach. I know, it's a really old joke, I know. Okay, I've, I've flogged this one so many times, like you, can, you can hardly believe it, but I know. When I, I, there was a school I used to teach at, and uh, every, during the weekend, the staff would often go out for a wild party. <laughs> wild party. You know, they'd be up to goodness, I don't even know if they even went to bed that night or whatever. It was just a wild party. And, um, and then I, I remember one day, um, one of the, the staff members, uh, Kate, would come to me and say, Matthew, uh, we, just to let you know, um, we didn't invite you to our, our party on Friday night because somehow we, we just thought, we don't think you're sort of fit in. <laughs> I wonder why. <laughs> you guess. Really, I wouldn't fit in. Why, why might that be? And they were doing it in the nicest possible way. But the reality is that when you are a follower of Jesus in a secular world, you are swimming against the flow. Your values, your priorities, your look, outlook to life is completely different. In some cases, you may even be seen as a social pariah. As someone totally, not just on the fringes, but actually may be you know, not good for society as a whole. In fact, 
Peter put it this way when he wrote in his letter. He said that for, for, for you have spent long enough or spent enough time in the past doing what the pagans choose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. They are surprised that you do not join them in their reckless living and they heap abuse on you. You don't sleep around. You don't get drunk. You don't curse. You don't engage in slander or in gossip. And as a result, you stand out as a peculiar person. Now listen guys, let me just say something here, okay? If you have failed in one of these areas, understand that God loves you and that there is grace and he can help us overcome. But the truth is this, as we learn to walk with God, as we journey with the, with the Lord, something of our life, we may not be sinless, but we do sin less over time. And with God's grace, there's something about our lives that makes us stand out as a peculiar person. But as well as imbibing of his word, as well as being willing to change and standing out, it's the fourth thing that we can learn from John's life, and that is this, we need to see service as a privilege. John the Dunker saw himself as a servant. And he says this, After me comes one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. John's message wasn't about him. We said, we said that from the very beginning. His message was about the one who followed him. I love it how it says in John's gospel. John said this, I must decrease and he must increase. Lord, will you help me, Lord, just to decrease? Not about me, not about how good I am. It's not about, what, you know. No, no, I must decrease and he must increase. Everything about my life, everything about our lives must be constantly pointing people to Jesus glorifying him, honoring him. And even though he may have seen being something of a, been seen something of an eccentric in his generation, nevertheless, he had a power and a charisma to his life because he saw everything about his life as a service to God. In fact, I was in one of the, the life groups earlier on last week and uh, we were just chatting actually about Paul's letter to the to Ephesians. And he was talking about the, the roles of, um, of uh, you know, servants and masters and everything that is entailed in that. But the thing that stuck out to me was this, that everything that we are to do is to be done as unto the Lord. Whether we're an employee or employer, whether we're working for someone, whether we're a boss, everything that we do it we do unto the Lord. It is a service unto the God. It is a privilege unto God. And that changes your outlook to life. It changes your, 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 your outlook and how you see things. There could be no higher calling in your life than to serve God's purpose in your generation. No greater joy than to live your life in service to Him, to see your life as a service unto God. That's wonderful. That gives your life a sense of purpose. It gives your life a sense of direction. That I am a servant of God. I'm here for as long on earth as long as God wants me to be, me to be here. And when my time of service is up, Lord, I, you can call me home for calling for, uh, calling for duty. For whatever you have for me next. So let's see our life, your work, your employment, your ministry in the church, your involvement in community, being a, a father, being a, a husband, being a wife, being a mother, see it as a service unto the Lord. But there's another thing that we can learn here from John's life and John's example that if we are to be heralds of the gospel in this broken world, we are to prepare this world for a Jesus encounter, and that is this, we need to be immersed in the Spirit. We need to be immersed in the Spirit. You know, I've once heard it said that trying to, to live the Christian life without the Holy Spirit is like a car trying to drive it on three cylinders. It just doesn't work. You're going to struggle. Trying to 
to live in the Word of God without the Holy Spirit. In fact, it will just become a dead religion. It will become a dead religion that has no power whatsoever. It doesn't mean anything. It actually maybe even hold you in a little bit of bondage, as it were, without the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit because where the Spirit of God is, there is freedom. And so we need the Holy Spirit to help us live out this life. You know, in some parts of the world, I would say, and more so even today now, more so with the way our culture is going today, it's impossible to be an effective witness for Jesus without the Holy Spirit. Impossible. You can't do it. You need the Holy Spirit. You know, in the parts of the world where, where you know, if someone goes to the, the church and they want to be healed and they don't get the healing they need, they'll go to the local witch doctor down the road and they're very animistic culture. That's the spiritual reality that in many parts of the world that people are dealing with. But even today in our culture today, increasingly, people are looking for alternative spiritual experiences. It seems to be on, on the rise, certainly more so than it ever has before. And as God's people filled with the Spirit... Actually, we could be an answer. We can help them on their journey. We can minister into that situation. When speaking of the greatness of who Jesus is, John says, I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you in the Holy Spirit. Amen. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? What, what John is saying is this Hey, listen, guys, I, I, I baptize you in water. <laughs> Yeah, it's a fluid medium. It's, it's a great stuff. But you know I There's someone who can baptize you in a better medium than water. <laughs> and it's called the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. And let me say something. For all of us here today, I can't baptize you in the Spirit. None, none, none of us here can baptize each other in the Holy Spirit. Only Jesus can do that. And that's why when we come to faith in Jesus, when we seek after Him, when we open our hearts to Him, and we ask, Lord, will you please fill me with your Spirit? Will you please baptize me with the Spirit? Will you please infuse me with the presence of your Spirit? I believe He will do it. He will do it for you. And He will empower you in your witness. And that's why John says, He's greater than me. He's more important than me. Because He offers you an experience of God that I can never offer you. Jesus said, you receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And so the Holy Spirit enables you to live the life that prepares your world for a Jesus encounter. Maybe some of you here today, I pray that God the Holy Spirit will just anoint you. Some of you have a, a responsibility for looking after people, for caring for people, for, for just um, healing people and playing that role. I pray that the Holy Spirit will anoint you to be an agent of God's healing in that environment. And God will use. Some of you have a, a responsibility for, for um, teaching young children or young people. I pray that, that when you are doing your profession, it will not just be you doing your job, but actually the Holy Spirit will minister through you. That even though you may not necessarily be speaking about Jesus in that environment, but nevertheless, Jesus is coming through, is shining through, and they see something different about your life. And so we prime our world by priming ourselves. And so we, we need to imbibe of His Word, be willing to change, stand out from the crowd, see service as a privilege, get immersed in the Spirit, and we live our lives as heralds of the gospel in this broken world, preparing this world for the most important event this world is yet to see when Christ will come back a second time. However, the most important question I need to ask you this morning, if you are to prepare your world for a Jesus encounter, is this. If Jesus were to return this week, I, I, I remember when I was a child, I used to hear these messages. If Jesus was to return tonight, <laughs> would you be ready? But you know, it's still true. Its relevance is as true today as it ever has been. Because the Bible says we need to watch and pray. Because you'll come at an hour we never expect. Do you expect him to return now? Probably not. 
Well, then this, this is when we need to be ready. If Jesus were to return this week, would you be ready to meet him? If the Lord of glory would appear on the clouds, would you weep or would you rejoice? The king is coming. Have you made a way in your heart to receive the king? Jesus once told a parable of a king who entrusted, this is in Luke's gospel, this is Luke's version, ten, uh, ten talents of silver, I think it was, or ten miners, I should say, to ten, uh, ten servants. And the king went away for a while, and then he came back again, which is the age that we're living in right now. He went away for a while, and then he came back again. And when he returned, one of the servants made a twofold increase, another made a one and a half fold increase in the investment. The other didn't do anything at all with the investment, didn't do nothing with it. He was not faithful with what had been entrusted to his care because he failed to prepare himself for the king to come. May we all individually and corporately as a church not fall into that category may we be people say lord help me to prepare myself for that amazing event in history help me to live my life today and every day as if you were returning and coming back today so that when you come back you have no problem recognizing me as belonging to you and i will not feel embarrassed or ashamed and i'll rejoice at seeing you in your majesty and glory and so if you want to be ready for the king's visitation, don't leave the service uh, this morning. Don't uh, leave this online service as well if you're watching online without taking that step of faith towards him. Turn from all that you know is wrong. Put your trust in him. Get immersed in water in his name if you haven't done so already. Open your heart. Receive of the Spirit. Uh, receive of the wonderful gift of the Spirit. And uh, live this life. Uh, where you live as a herald of the gospel in your, in your broken world. Amen. Let's pray. We thank you, Father. Jesus, we thank you, Lord, that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever, Lord. And Lord, we thank you that like John the Baptist, prepare, you, you, know, you said there was none greater of women than John the Baptist. John the Baptist was such a humble man because everything about his life was all about you. And Lord, we, we thank you for the ministry of John the Baptist who prepared a way in his day for your coming uh, to, to the nation of Judea and Samaria and to Israel. But Lord, I pray that as a church, as your people, that you will help us to take on that mantle of John the Baptist. Help us, Lord, to be prepared in ourselves to prepare our world for the greatest event. Lord, let us help us to live our lives as heralds of the gospel. And Lord, when we fail and when we maybe let down our witness for every, whatever reason, Lord God, just give us the courage just to be honest and maybe apologize to a few people, ask for their forgiveness. But Lord God, just to give, live our lives as authentic followers of you, and Lord, be a salt and light for you in this dark world. And that something of our lives will draw others to the knowledge of you. We ask this now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If there's anyone here, or maybe you're watching online, and you know you've not uh, yet come to that point of uh, putting your trust in the Lord, uh, I'm going to just pray this prayer. I'm going to invite you to repeat these words after me in your heart. Lord Jesus Christ, I'm sorry for the things that are wrong in my life. Please forgive me. And I'll turn from all that I know is wrong. Thank you that you died on the cross for me so that I can be forgiven and set free. Thank you that you offer me forgiveness in the gift of your Spirit. I now receive that gift. Please come into my life by your Spirit and be with me forever. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen.